Hello, Zero K fans, and welcome to the December 1v1 tournament. I am your host, Dominic, or Shadow Fury, if you're still on that. I, I gotta drop that name sooner or later. Anyway, the tournament is going to be a double elimination tournament. There are eight players in. We have Matthew Whiteman versus Chapel. Oh, Matthew Whiteman, Chapel, Steel Blue, Daniel Bress, 45, Orange Sky, Dice 68, Hawk 588, and Ultra Godzilla all vying for winning this tournament. Would say champion, but Golda isn't here, so I mean it's it's still a tournament. So I'm gonna be starting out with Orange Sky versus Dice. I think that's gonna be probably the most even match, and we will be starting on Vantage the entire winners quarterfinals. It is a best of one. This entire tournament is best of one up until the grand finals and possibly little bracket finals. So that is how it will work. And all of the first matches are going to be on Vantage, a map which we saw a little bit. I remember making a comment about how it is not the flattest map. It is fairly flat, but it isn't as flat as it looks. So I don't expect we're going to be seeing anything out of the ordinary. It's kind of funny. If there actually was a little project to go through all the details of all of the all the factories and matchups and everything in this game... And rovers, especially at lower levels, are, like, the most popular and the most effective factory. Whereas with the... With the, mid, with the upper levels, it's pretty even. Pretty much everything is used and everything's just about as good. But, yeah, lower bracket, it was, like, rovers are super popular, and I imagine we'll be seeing a lot of that. Although Dyth is going for tanks, another reasonably popular choice. And Cloaky for Orange Sky, because Cloaky got a massive buff recently... And that is going to be interesting. And for those of you in the chat wondering, Wesley, no, there's no 400. They didn't show up. Did they, did they show up? Nope, they are not in the tournament channel. So, no, Wesley, sorry about that. 400 is not here. Anyway, Orange Sky is, again, going for Cloaky, which got buffed recently. The Knight is now viable, basically. It, it was, it kind of had too short a range to be useful. I mean, it's still useful, but it wasn't really used. People were kind of sleeping on it. So I got a massive buff. I imagine that'll be paired back once people start using it more and realizing, hey, yeah, Cloaky has a late game option. So the Cloaky late game option is really strong. Though on a map like this, I'm not sure how effective it'll be. It's, I mean, it's not a giant map, but it is still fairly big. And knights are not very fast. I don't know. We'll see what happens. Anyway, fairly standard start from Orange Sky. Actually, fairly economic start from Orange Sky. They are going just, you know, Glaive protecting the the Conjure. Conjure is also has been upgraded recently. It, it's not set up for doing this right now, but it has an area cloak that is optional. It could use literally right now if it wanted to, actually. Although I wouldn't recommend it just because it would use a lot of energy. But yeah, the, the Conjure now has an area cloak, much like the Iris. So essentially, Cloakbot Factory gets a cheap iris that doesn't require the constructors to get busy, to be busy, to get to be occupied building the constructor. Sorry, building the iris, or building the eraser, which then morphs into the iris. So yeah, Cloakbot got a lot of upgrades, and judging by that earlier match chart, they were kind of, they were a little bit underpowered, but not by much. It wasn't ever a massive matchup disparity. It'll be interesting to see how those matchup charts vary from now, because I feel like Cloakbot is going to get a lot of love and is going to end up being quite powerful. But we'll see what happens. Definitely Orange Sky is thinking that themselves. They want to see if they can make use of those buffs to actually make things go in their favor against Dyth. Though at the moment, Dyth is definitely ahead economically. They managed to get that construction in the front lines, get those early metal extractors far faster than Orange Sky has. And that's 5 metal per second advantage early on in the game. That is not nothing. I mean, 5 metal per second... Well, it's really 50%. Almost double economy. Two minutes into the game. Now, granted, Dyth is playing tanks. So Dyth does need that higher economy just to be able to build... Stuff? Like, anything? The cheapest unit is the Kodachi at 160 metal. So, it's not quite the same. Assuming, of course, Orange Guy can actually keep their army alive. But, yeah, Cloakbots, they're just cheaper. So it's not a huge deal yet, but I would still say Orange Sky's going to want to expand. And they are expanding. They are unfortunately kind of low on metal and running into some problems in terms of priority. But that might be a moot point as it's Kodachi coming in here is forcing yet again there to be more of a, more of a push for defense. Which at least 
at least Orange Guy's holding on to what they're managing to capture. Nothing else. I mean, that Lotus survived the Kodachi attack. The Kodachis themselves are so damaged that they really don't have a whole lot of room to maneuver without getting themselves killed. I mean, they are regenerating, of course, but they are still going to be coming back a little bit weaker. Gonna spend a little longer to get there. Orange Guy's gonna have that chance to build up, but again, Dyth has gone and just built up even more. I mean, they've gotten a couple more metal extractors. They've... I mean, they have fewer defenses. So it's theoretically possible for some glaives to get in, but then again, Ogre. Ogre exists, so that's going to be a bit of an issue. Kodachi as well coming in once again on the back lines for Orange Guy, trying to harass, and this time being successful, getting rid of a couple metal extractors. Again, continuing to keep Orange Guy's economy low. That's the thing. That's the biggest thing. Orange Guy simply cannot keep their economy going, just because every time they start building stuff up, these Kodachis come and destroy it. And again, another Kodachi just gets rid of a glaive as it's being chased out. Again, that Kodachi is not able to harass, but... Still, Orange Sky is behind. They're not managing to get those metal extractors up, and they're going to have to rebuild in the main base. Which I imagine they're there. Yeah, Orange Sky's commander are already on that. Still, Orange Sky is there rebuilding. Dyth has been completely un unharassed. This entire game, their entire their construction has just stayed there. Orange Sky has a glaive hanging out just to see if anything goes north, but that doesn't matter. That glaive hasn't actually done any real work in it. Honestly, can't. The Lotuses would kill it. Or the Ogre, or... The commander, everything is kind of a threat. Whereas over here, Dice is just able to harass with impunity. I mean, the Skadachis are getting threatened and have to be pulled back from time to time, but again, they can heal. And this Kodachi over here, it's healing up. It'll be a few more seconds and it's at full health. And the one over to the north, I mean, again, it's healing up pretty well. And now the Ogre coming in, and there is nothing in place to stop it. I mean, the warrior will not be able to do much. So, Northern Expansion being completely destroyed. Orange Sky losing more and more of their economy. But Phantom is coming up, but unfortunately the early Kodachi attack did stop the first Phantom from being built. So now there's really nothing left. Orange Sky's commander doing what they can to set that up. But it's not going to happen. Orange Sky throws in the towel. Dyth takes it. Orange Sky gets dropped down to the lower bracket. And Dyth continues on in the upper bracket quarterfinals. Very quick. I thought this would be a more even match, but apparently I was wrong. So let's just review that bracket. I mean, that entire match was essentially determined by the harassment. Like, Kodachis, just throw them in and let them kill things. And that works. So, I gotta find another game to continue with. Let's see what other games we have. I think... Oof. Okay, well, what's... What's still running? Actually, I'm curious. Okay, what, what's going on with Hawk and Ultra Godzilla? It's actually the least even match, but it's lasted longer. I'm really curious how this is going. Alright. Let's just get this on. So yeah, Ultra Godzilla definitely the favorite to win this coming up match. But I am... Honestly surprised that it's lasted as long as it has. All right, and oh, didn't unmute the game. Yeah. Ah, well, Ultra Godzilla actually, well, up against, they're cloaky against tanks, and Blitzes are managing to do a little bit of work, but Ultra Godzilla expanding way too fast for Hawk to be able to keep up. I mean, kind of what we saw last game, but even more aggressively. And this time, Hawk does have the tanks. They do have that nice aggressive construction, or at least have the they have the welders they can work with. But Ultra Godzilla just going in there, pretty aggressively. Almost a bit too aggressively. I mean, they have a lot of the economy. They've, they've got most of the map to their name. But that commander is running themselves into a very risky position, and I don't know if I totally agree with that. Hawk 588 is going... Or Hawk, just call him that for now. Hawk? Okay, they're kind of done. Admittedly, though, they could... If they hurt, assisted their factory, they'd actually be in a pretty good spot. Like, Ultra Godzilla is very forward-focused. And while they do have a lot of territory to work with, it's mostly naked expansions. So a good push through the commander and what's being built up here would actually allow for a massive break through all of Ultra Godzilla's lines. And what do you got? You got, yeah, some cloakbot stuff, builders, that's about it. And Hawk on to the caretakers. 
Get the caretakers, get a few more power plants. Reclaim as much as you can. That should do the trick. Still gonna be tricky, and the knights are coming up. Ultra Godzilla with those new buff knights. Ella, it feels like there's even with the ogres. I mean, they are 350 compared to 500. Uh, okay, the ogres are more expensive. But this is it. This is actually, this is it. If Hawk manages to pull this out, then they are gonna come back, but I don't see that happening. The knights are just way too strong. Able to sound at everything. The ogres at least have a bit of a chance, but unfortunately, only one ogre is not going to be enough to deal with this. And they're certainly trying. It's a valiant effort, but it is unfortunately one with too few numbers to make work. And Ultra Godzilla looks like they are on the cusp of victory right now. But I gotta get, hand it to Hawk. They have done a very good... They have done a spectacular job, considering the sheer rank disparity between them. I mean, I expected that Hawk would be the first to go out, but... No, they are holding on. And that is going to be a still decisive victory. I mean, th this is the thing. This is really the thing. There's Hawk just cannot get anything done with the knights stunning everything they have. If they had two or three ogres, they'd probably be fine. Or a minotaur or two just to absorb the ogre fire, or the night fire. Like, it's just, you can't get that with 26 metal per second. It's just not enough. Especially when you don't have the energy to actually use all that metal. And unfortunately, there are no other workers for Hawks, so they can't... Or there is one. And that one worker is actually building power plants. But more are needed. 22 energy on 26 metal is not enough. You will not use it all. And Hawk just throwing units away. See, at this point, Ultra Godzilla really does not care. It's got to contain all around. And Hawk, I mean, they're playing it like a tournament. They are not throwing in the towel too soon. But this is... This is it. The Knights are destroying Hawk's commander. I think when the commander goes down, Hawk will decide, you know what? This this game is over. Because, you know what? This, this game, unfortunately, for Hawk is over. So, anyway, back to the chat. So, the there's a bit of a question here. So, how many workers do you, do you need per base? Which is kind of the wrong question. Basically, you want to have... Like, every worker uses 5 metal per second. Every caretaker uses 10. Every factory uses 10. So you want to have about, like, for metal extractors, usually two or three metal per second. Usually two. So for every, I guess, every two or three metal extractors, you want a worker. You, you want a worker helping the factory. Or doing other things. That, I'd say, is roughly the calculus. But usually, just look at your bars. If you have, if your metal is, if, I mean, you can't see it here because of the spectator mode. But in the player mode, you have the metal income and metal metal income in green, metal spending in red. If your metal spending is higher than your metal income, then you're fine. If it's lower, then add workers until it's higher. That's basically it. And... Yeah. I would love, love to see Minotaurs in this match. Yeah, KKK is pointing on the chat as well. Like, Minotaurs would have been interesting, and I agree. Minotaurs would have been a good choice just because they have such high HP. I think it's like 6,000 HP. And the Knight deals 600 paralysis damage, so it take 10 hits from the Knight to paralyze a full health Minotaur. Or... I feel like I've got that wrong. But yeah, it would, it would take a lot to paralyze a full health Minotaur, which would allow the Ogres to do their damage. And if the Ogres don't do the damage, the Minotaur is going to be doing a bunch of damage. So it still works out. But yeah, okay, Ultra Godzilla basically took it from kind of a obvious spot. So really Minotaur gets stunlocked easily? Even even for its high HP. The FFC is pointing out that there is apparently a flaw in my logic. That is good to know, because I thought. I was thinking Minotaurs would be fine. Like, I mean, use them as a... Literally as a tank. Just use them as a way to... Keep the knights from killing anything else while the ogres are doing their damage. So yeah, that's kind of... That's kind of the thing I'm thinking of. Well, at any rate, looks like we are going to be... 
waiting on round two. So yeah, I'll throw it in intermission for the time being as we wait for round two to be set up. It looks like there has been a bit of a confusion as to how exactly the results are being set up. But yeah. Okay, FSC also pointing out that knights are countered by skirmishers or bombs. Or emissaries in the case of the tanks. That's a fair point. Emissaries would do a good job here. So yeah, for future reference, use emissaries. So anyway, we're going to be going to a bit of a break until round two happens. So stay tuned. We'll be back once round two is set up.